I flew the AH-1 Cobra. Um, I asked for the Cobra when I uh, got into flight school. They gave me Hueys. <laughs> of course. At the end of the uh, the uh, five month course in rotary wing uh, aviation, in, in early entry rotary wing aviation, at the end of it, they basically said, "We have a shortage of Cobra pilots. Does anybody here want to fly a Cobra?" <laughs> So I got to stay in uh, Fort Rucker for another two months. Lucky me. Um, but uh, I uh, was a paratrooper in the uh, first place. I actually got into the military to get uh, money for college. I wanted to join NASA. I uh, wanted to be an uh, astrophysicist or a biologist uh, working in the space program. Uh, didn't know squat about the Army. Told the recruiter I wanted to uh, fly. He said you had to be a warrant officer for that. I assumed you needed college for that. You don't. You fly helicopters in the Army, all you got to do is be able to pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time. <laughs> it's really good if you can chew gum while you're doing that, too. They'll promote you faster. Um, however, I got into uh, airborne infantry, which was a lot of fun, you know, a lot of terror, a lot of uh, sleepless nights, a lot of uh, hunger pains. Um, they pretty much treat you pretty horribly, but, you know, that's what we're being paid for. So you can't really complain with that. Uh, but I've been stationed in uh, the 509th Airborne Infantry in Italy. Uh, I've been also got uh, years in the 82nd Airborne Division. I've deployed throughout Europe, uh, as far north as Norway, as far south as Spain. We actually saw them filming Empire Strikes Back. Uh, we were on the ice planet of Hoth. It's a fun little place. Uh, we had our, our sniper guys. They could actually make up a guy in the Wookiee suit. So we realized, oh, they're making a part two to Star Wars. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, with the 82nd, I've done operations down in uh, Central and South America, as well as uh, Louisiana. Um, but uh, after 10 years, I put in the packet to finally do that whole flying thing, um, and uh, the rest is history. They basically sent me to flight school, graduated as a Huey pilot, ticked off, um, got into Cobras. It was the most fun I've ever had. Um, the firepower that that thing puts out is tremendous. What you have there are the, uh, the first versions of that aircraft and the last versions of that aircraft. Um, the Marines are the ones that fly the latest version. It's the Whiskey, I'm sorry, the Zulu model. It is like the one we have on steroids. Um, there's nothing that thing can't do, but uh, during the uh, time that um, they, uh, the Army proposed a more advanced aircraft because in Vietnam, all they had was um, Huey Hawks, modified Hueys with rocket pods, machine gun pods, missile launchers. Uh, they did everything that they could to make it a fighting aircraft, and it, it did a really good job. The only problem was it wasn't fast enough to stay up with the Chinooks. They would always outrun them. And so the Chinooks actually had to you know, slow it back just to make sure that they didn't outrun their escorts. Um, so the uh, Department of the Army, they asked uh, the uh, aircraft manufacturers for a faster, more uh, versatile attack aircraft, one dedicated for attack. Um, they came out with three different prototypes, the Cheyenne, the Apache, and one called the Blackhawk. Not the Liftbird, but it's a completely different aircraft. Um, it took Bell Helicopter six months to chop up a Huey, reassemble it, put it together, and came up with the Cobra in six months. A year later, a little over a year later, it was flying in Vietnam. The winner of that contract of the other three, the Apache, it took them 20 years to get that thing off the assembly line. 20 years. The Cobra was supposed to... I'm sorry? Who was the manufacturer of that? McDonnell Douglas. Um... On paper, it worked great. I went to the uh, uh, Apache course, um, and fortunately, I didn't. You know, it was a budget cut thing, a thing with a president named Clinton. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But, uh, the point is that they have been updating and upgrading the Cobra only as much as they needed to. Um, they never, ever went to the, uh, the Super Cobra that the Marine Corps has, and there was a company actually in Tustin, California, that said, look, if you give us one of your S or F model airframes and one point, I think $3 million will upgrade it to the Marine Super Cobra standards. The Department of Defense said, you know what, yeah, we'll just pay 
12 million dollars for an Apache. We could have gotten seven Super Cobras for one Apache. And I'm not saying the Apache is dreadful. Plenty of other people have said that. But <laughs> they have been able to work out many of the bugs in that system. They call Terminex. They got right to work. It's just got a bunch of electrical glitches in it, computer problems. Uh, and that's what I noticed whenever I got to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. Um, they had Apaches there, same as Fort Hood. I noticed the difference between the Apaches. We, fly, we flew. They didn't. They uh, moved us to Fort Hood, Texas, 2nd Armored. And uh, they put us in a hangar, a big A-frame shaped hangar that the wrecking ball was hours from demolishing. But they uh, started a brack move and they moved us from the 4th ID to Fort Hood. And um, we had our Hueys, our Cobras, and our Scouts in this one little hangar that uh, everybody out there nicknamed Jurassic Park. <laughs> but you know what? We flew. Who was the original manufacturer of the Cobra? Bell Helicopters. Yeah. I mean, they, all they did was they just took the Huey, they, you know, the guys with the slide rules, pocket pencils, and the duct tape. They basically just stripped off everything that the Huey did not need to fly. They stuck wings on it, put them in a, a, a tandem type of configuration. And again, within six months, the first prototype was flying. They had pretty much all the bugs worked out of it three months later. So total of nine months in development before you got to that one that you have in that picture there. Nine months. It lasted until 1999. From 19, it served from 1967 when it went to Vietnam until 1999. Pretty decent. How many did they build? Uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,100. It could have been 1,400, but I think 1,100. And they are all, all over the world. Yes, sir. Why do some have the tailwind on the port and others have the starboard side? That might be a Marine Corps modification. The Marines, uh, they had the J model, which is, again, similar to that one, but they, they needed one with two engines. So after that, they just started making changes. Yeah. That's the Marines. Now, it may have something to do with the power of the engines. Those are, and, and it wasn't the engine that's a problem in the, uh, the Huey. It has the uh, Cobra. It's got the same engine as a Huey. The problem is the transmission. The transmission can't take that much power. So they actually have to governor down the engine to be able to not destroy the transmission. Again, the Department of Defense could have upgraded it to the Marine standard, but they said, well, this Apache, it's going to be rolling off the assembly line any day now. Any day now. So, but the, one, the, the thing about it that uh, is really good now is a tactical operations threat officer. Uh, so my whole job was dealing with people getting shot down, escape and evasion, all that kind of stuff. That's a tough aircraft to take out of the sky. Um, if you hit it, oh, it's coming down, without a doubt. So, but what it does have is, from front to back, they've got a 20 millimeter cannon, fires 12 and a half rounds per second. They have a uh, radar jammer on that that will jam most of the uh, ground, uh, the ground uh, anti-aircraft guns. Um, they have a uh, three feet wide profile. You can't see it. Most of our weapon systems work from 2.5 to 2.8 miles away. Okay? We hover in the trees. You'll never see us. You'll never hear us. Those rocket pods with the uh, fire control computer, the laser rangefinder, and the air data sensor allows us to hit area targets out to a distance of close to four miles. We have different kinds of warheads for those. It's a total of about uh, 28 to 30 different type now, and it ranges uh, anywhere between high explosive, um, heavy, high explosive light. We have one that's called Beehive Round, which explodes, uh, and uh, excuse me, but some of the um, terminology here might get a little rough, but the, the whole point of that thing is it's not a medevac helicopter. It's made to do one thing and one thing only. It destroys targets, and it does it incredibly well. The um, rockets, though, with the laser rangefinder, the ads boom, and uh, the RMS, the rocket management system, allows you to hit targets you can barely see. So when you come into an area uh, and a company has six operable Cobras, um, the scouts are basically ahead of us. They don't make nearly as much noise, so they can generally get in close. They do what's called an aerial handoff. They tell us where the targets are. We can pick them up. We are talking between one another. I'm looking through a 13 power sight in the uh, front of the aircraft. I can put a missile through a four by four foot box while it's moving 2.3 miles away. 
there's nothing that thing won't kill, except an M1. No. But um, it's a very fast machine. You just It's just heavy, and you just got to learn how to fly it. It's not like the lighter one you see there. That thing can almost do a, a complete rollover. Um, that one, you got to be a lot more careful, but um, it's a very, very good machine, extremely reliable. Um, the first crew chiefs were Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble. You know, I've actually had a crew chief who we had a fuel boost pump failure on the on start. We can't leave the ground with this light on and Specialist Wolf goes inside of the uh, hangar. He comes out with a rubber mallet. I wasn't sure what he was doing. He crawls underneath the aircraft and I could hear boom, 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 and the light went out. <laughs> you see that done with an Apache. <laughs> so... Anyway, um, like I said, I, I've had a, the time of my life for the 20 years. It's been some rough times, some good times, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, in between, I sit, spent a small amount of time in the National Guard where I was a firefighter and an emergency medical technician. I was with LEFD for uh, about, uh, nine months, and uh, then they coaxed me back in saying, I heard you wanted to fly helicopters. Just sign the papers. Sign the papers. Quiet, sign it. So, anyway. Um, but you know, so we're going to start on this. Unless anybody has any questions on that aspect, nope. Good to go. Oh. Did, did the ones you flew have the composite rotor blades? They had um, K747 blades. Those are they're made of metal, uh, aluminum, uh, and what it is is if you look at them, they have a distinct shape. That's meant for it's it's wider than the Huey blades, yeah. and the originals were from the Huey, the 540 blades. We have 740 blade, 747 blades on there, and that's what you got out there. That's inside is like a honeycomb laminate structure. It is designed to be sound suppressive. If that thing is hovering um, less than um, a quarter of a mile away over grass, you're not going to hear it. They have the um, sound suppression uh, rotor. They have a what's called the black hole uh, IR suppressor on the uh, tailpipe. So it basically cools the air, the uh, hot air coming out of the engine. Um, it has an infrared jammer that will jam every shoulder-fired missile, at least while I was in. And they've probably gone to the AOQ-144 Bravo model or Charlie model, which would probably jam the sun if it was close enough. Um, <laughs> They've got uh, chaff packets on there as well as uh, um, um, flare packets on the tail. And again, we got we got to know what the enemy is, what they have. And then uh, I was one of the ones who basically set the jam programs. Um, so it's got a lot of survival stuff. The bottom line is it's incredibly difficult for uh, heat-seeking missiles to shoot it out of the sky. It is pretty hard for um, radar weapons to even pick it up. And what, in this briefing here... Uh, pretty powerful attribute for that Apache, and this is flying low level, he got within five kilometers of an anti-aircraft radar and gun system they never saw. Him. Five kilometers. And once they started unleashing the Hellfires, and they were empty of Hellfires, they started creeping in with the 2.75 inch rockets and just blasting away, and then they started with a 30 millimeter, so they expended maximum ordnance on the targets, because they had to be gone. So... This thing, what was your maximum hover altitude? We were not allowed to fly over 14,000 feet for any reason whatsoever, and that deals with human physiology. We have to be able to... You have to have oxygen. Right, exactly. And you don't. As far as how high you can hover, uh, to be honest with you, we do what's called a uh, flight uh, control check where we basically go, you know, we're, we're heavy as we are, we go up to a 50-foot hover and we do a nice slow turn. If we lose tail rotor um, authority throughout that uh, event, we need to land and probably remove some of the weapons on it, some of the missiles or you know, whatever we got to to make it a bit lighter. But that's uh, as far as we go. Now, me personally... Um, me and my buddy, we went up to uh, about 12,000, 13,000 feet over the north shore of Oahu and just started diving through the clouds. That was kind of fun. <laughs> but uh, we've actually tried to hover inside of a cloud to break it up, too. This shows you just where your tax dollars are going. So, um, But it, it's a good machine. Um, like I said, that uh, marine version, that thing will do anything on the book. That thing will write its own book. You know, there's no limitations. How much is this? Um, in forward flight, um, the wings are there to hold the weapons on. It may give some stability, but the 
vast majority of the control comes from the rotor disc and the tail and synchronized elevators. So you pull the cyclic back, the uh, main rotor starts to rise up, the tail uh, planes start to actually go down, and it gives us the ability to go change our attitudes pretty quickly. Um, we got to also be careful that we don't do what's called a negative G flying. We can't go below half a negative G. So we don't dive forward if there's a target uh, off to our left or right. What we've got to do is basically roll into it and start the attack from there. Again, you have to know how to fly that helicopter. Otherwise, you will get yourself in trouble. So, anything else? Sir, what about mass bump? Don't do that. <laughs> um, for mass bump, I've never experienced it myself, but we can't land any greater than seven degrees. Uh, any more than seven degrees of the rotor di disc tilting, you will actually hit the mast. Uh, they've got a semi, um, semi rigid rotor system, so whenever we're putting down on like, you know, really broken up ground, heavy rocks, you're just bringing it down really, really, really slow, looking at the attitude indicator the whole time. If it's going to get in a situation like that, hopefully somebody will come out there and put a brick underneath the low side. So, but yeah, you, again, you just have to be careful. Now, the A64 longbow, that's about as best you're going to get. They, the longbow is a different aircraft than the A64, the basic one. They have uh, basically redesigned, redesigned the aircraft. Uh, from stem to stern. It is not a AH-64. It is something else entirely. Anyway, uh, anything else? Okay. So we're not imagining things. Okay. Uh, as before, I mentioned that um, from the grunt side, and I'm not sure if that's exactly how I got into the position, but my position, my, you know, if I had a desk, it would be Ernest Hicks, CW2, uh, um, tactical Operations Electronic Warfare Threat Officer. My job was to assess what the bad guys have, um, know what we have to be able to counter what they have. I also work with the S3 and S2 on plans, that's um, Operations and Intel, um, to be able to put together a plan. So this that I'm covering is actually what I did, just on a smaller level. I did it on battalion and brigade size. What I'm talking about here is basically the entire military. One of the other things that we had to do as EWOs is we have to know generally what the fast movers can do so that we can uh, be the liaison to call for airstrikes and such. We got to know generally how what their limitations are as far as how low they can go, what kind of weather they can fly in, what kind of weapons they have. If we have a laser range finder, a ground laser identifier, sorry, a GLID, we can laser a target that uh, they can basically affect it with Mavericks or Hellfires or whatever else they have. I work with the ground troops as well. I stayed with these guys with a 25th ID, with a 4th ID, with a 2nd Infantry Division. I was a pilot who was also a ground pounder. So I basically talked um, helicopteries to them and basically just arranged specifically that kind of thing, airstrikes. Um, my job was also to train other air crew members in escape and evasion and the POW escape and evasion, you know, how to lie really, really well. Um, so anything bad that can happen inside and outside of the cockpit, that was my job, uh, as well as teaching them how to do some of the other stuff like perimeter defenses and stuff like that, um, just the grunt stuff. I was basically like Lieutenant Worf with these guys. So, um, but I have worked uh, in this sphere uh, for this class uh, a lot of the stuff was just kind of refresher and to see what the newer stuff does today. I retired in 97, so they've changed a couple of things since I've been out, so you know, bear with me. Okay, so before we get started, do we have any questions? Oh, good to go. All right. Um, I was expecting more of a civilian group here, people who are not as versed in what we do with the Department of Defense. And there was a couple of uh, things that kind of stood out. Um, General uh, MacArthur, he basically said that um, the destructiveness of the war potential through progressive advances in scientific discovery has, in fact, now reached a point that revises the traditional concept of war. War, the most malignant scourge and the greatest sin of mankind, can no longer be controlled, only abolished. We are a long way from that. Hopefully, with diplomacy, we won't have to do this type of thing anymore. 
unfortunately, again, we are a long way from that. Um, but it is, like they basically said, the uh, serviceman is the one who abhors war more than anybody else. So even though I'm talking about things that seem to be antiseptic, never forget, lives are being lost here. The only saving grace with any of this stuff is that um, we have cut down at least on the collateral damage when we have to go in and do these kinds of operations. Um, you can look at pictures of Berlin. You can look at pictures of uh, cities in uh, Japan. And then you could look at places like uh, uh, Iraq, Baghdad. It's not even on the same level of destruction. Um, Desert Storm number two, after the uh, cruise missiles and the B-2s hit the targets and that wonderful little uh, fireworks display all at one time, um, people were going back to work the very next day. Okay, I mean, We have an artillery uh, piece, um, it's called a bullpup. It's a uh, laser, not a laser guide, it's a satellite guided artillery piece. It's a 155 millimeter. It'll uh, be fired about 20 some odd miles if you have um, guys in a uh, building that they're being really uncooperative, AK machine gun fire and rocket fire and such. They can drop that round right in the center of that building and it will drop it like a house of cards. You won't have so much as a, a rock dribbling across the, the, uh, across the sidewalk. The problem with that is they are very, very, very expensive things to use. So the cost of this stuff is going up, but the um, potential for civilian loss of life is actually going down. So anyway, so um, this is basically on um, modern air ground combat, what we do today, how we do this stuff. Um, intelligence tells us where to apply pressure. And if you know where to hit a target, you don't have to keep swinging at it as much. We have to open our eyes to where this stuff is. Um, throughout the uh, decades, as long as man has been able to talk and fight, uh, we've been able to break codes. The Japanese and the German codes were broken uh, during World War II. And with that, we knew exactly where the Japanese were going to hit. We could uh, put our ships in position to stop them. And um, it was uh, a turning point in the war that, you know, yeah, it took more years, but it went a lot shorter than it could have gone. Now, originally, and a lot of people may not realize this, the Japanese were supposed to only, well, their primary targets were supposed to be the aircraft carriers. There were no aircraft carriers in Pearl Harbor that day. They had to slow down because of bad uh, weather. Apparently, there was no Japanese spies worth a grain of salt to tell them, don't, don't come in now, wait, you know, they're not here yet. Um, so, you know, again, if you know where to hit, if you can communicate, that's, um, that's half the battle right there. Same thing with the Germans. The, um, the British got a hold of an Enigma machine off of a uh, non-scuttled U-boat, uh, and they were able to read the Japanese codes. They knew exactly what, sorry, the German codes. They knew exactly what they were planning. And so they put up counter offenses to be able to counter what they have. But again, they couldn't make it too obvious because... Uh, Admiral Dunnitz would realize, and he couldn't figure out how the heck we, you know, the British were able to get people in position, you know, to be able to stop a lot of these things. He was thinking it was just pure luck. And other people were too afraid to tell him they probably have broken the code. They didn't know that. Up until the end of the war, he didn't know that that's how it ha actually happened. So, you know, you got to know where to hit your target in order to bring them down a lot more effectively. Uh, ultimately being patient, observing the target area, or the enemy brings about huge gains, which will, be sh which will shorten the length of the conflict. Um, the airline battle conflict. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Observation, infiltration, interdiction of centralized defensive measures, and combined battle tasks. Um, on observation, we've got a number of platforms that we use. We've got satellite systems, high to low. Um, Global Hawk hovers around 60,000 feet. Um, we don't use the Global, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Predators and Reapers at this point. They would basically just kind of give away the ball game. Um, electronic eavesdropping uh, as well as uh, uh, computers. Um, infiltration, we're talking about how to get into a area with our own eyeballs to be able to see it ourselves. Uh, so, but basically speaking about uh, the first part, Satellites. Okay, 
Since 1957, they've put up about uh, 6,000 satellites in orbit. Of those, total time right now, we've basically got about uh, 3,600 in there, and about 1,000 of those still remain working, you know, to some extent or another. Um, that's a lot of satellites. Most of the ones that are fired off of Vandenberg are military payloads. They don't tell you what they do. They don't want to tell you what they do. But uh, they're kind of sneaky with that. Uh, and the fact that we had two in geosynchronous orbits, that's at 22,300 miles above the Earth, following the Earth's rotation. So they're basically just hovering there in the same spot of space. We had put up two satellites about a week apart. They were both parked in geosynchronous orbit about uh, 60 miles apart. Oddly enough, the Russians launched one that sat and is still to this day sitting right between those two satellites. Imagine the coincidence. So again, I don't know what those satellites do, but uh, apparently the Russians did, did or you know, so they sent up something to either block it or um, maybe take some of the information. Um, they help with uh, reconnaissance, navigation, early warning, and communication. Without them, uh, we'd be in a lot of trouble because most of the stuff that we do deals with satellites. So the very early part of anything that we do, if we are going to, and I'm going to use Iraq here because it is, it's basically the, the perfect uh, example of how everything went as right as possible. Um, so reconnaissance, we got 12 countries. All right? We're getting this. Oh, there we go. Okay, there's 12 countries that are actually putting up reconnaissance or spy satellites at this time. Uh, you've got us, France, Japan, China, UK, India, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Iran, and North Korea, believe it or not. Um, the uh, European Space Agency, they have uh, vaulted programs where they work together for the most part. Um, we've actually used the ESA at times too. But pretty much anybody with a launching pad and enough gun power can put a satellite in, into the sky. Um, uh, we also had ASAT technology. ASAT is an anti-satellite missile system. We can blow a satellite out of the sky. Or actually, we can knock it out of the sky because the uh, warhead is in Earth. It's just a, a ball. It's a kinetic killer. Um, we had an F-15 uh, actually hit a uh, old satellite. Um, it's at uh, 345 miles above the Earth. Uh, we don't do that anymore. As a matter of fact, Congress kind of outlawed this type of technology because... Yeah, it hit the satellite, but it left a lot of debris up there, and we still have missions going on up there. And if you keep practicing that kind of stuff, it's going to be a mess up there. And the last thing you need if you're doing a spacewalk is for some plastic chip to go through your spacesuit and kill you. So even tiny little, uh, little micrometeorites about a little bit larger than a grain of sand will punch a hole through some of those uh, panels that's uh, a, a good inch, inch and a half across. Just the speed at which this stuff flies, it just makes it more and more devastating. So we have the ability to destroy satellites. We don't use that. There is also projects that are using high intensity focused lasers to be able to impair those optical satellites. Uh, let's see here. Okay, next one. Anybody know what this is? Little Global Hawk. Um, this is a basically the same thing as a predator. When it first came out, it was primarily used to observe targets. Uh, its ceiling is about 25,000 feet. The CIA thought, hey, why don't we put some missiles on it? So that's where it sits today. It's no longer an observer. The uh, Global Hawk, though, this thing behind me, it actually is going to continue in that role. It flies about as high as a U-2, ceiling's about uh, 60,000 feet. And it has enough fuel to last for greater than 30 hours. So this is one of those systems where you're going to have basically airmen being rotated out through a little trailer off outside of Las Vegas from time to time. Um, they're uh, running at about 220 million per aircraft. The Navy is getting their brand new one, which is going to be a lot more expensive than that. They got 14,500 mile range, and it's still being used by us, NASA, and NATO. We also have electronic intercepts. We should have that there. Electronics. Electronic intercepts. Oh, yes. This is how big this thing is, if you've never seen it before. It's got a turbofan engine. It basically sips gas. Um, and again, they, they basically started out at about 
a uh, hundred million dollars, and they've more than doubled in price, and they're probably going to keep going up. We got about forty-two of these things uh, operational right now. Um, like I said, it's a very large aircraft, <coughs> unmanned, of course. Uh, Ernie, can they land that on a carrier? Uh, no. It, it's got a lot. Yeah, it's got to go pretty quick just to be able to avoid plummeting you know, in. All right. So electronic intercepts or signals intercepts. We had something called Saida Subversion and Espionage directed against the Army. We go through this uh, twice a year. Um, you can basically be uh, listening to somebody on radio, telephone, microwaves, copying machines, electric typewriters, of course, computer networks. We're talking hacking, window glass. There are these devices called laser microscope or microphones. They basically, whenever you're talking in the inside of a building, the glass will vibrate. It'll have a resonance that these laser microphones can pick it up, and it's pretty much like a needle in the uh, in the grooves of an album. Um, they can actually hear what you're saying uh, and reproduce it. Uh, and listening devices, both active and passive. And right now, um, DARPA. Okay, nothing I say here is secret. They're working on bugs that actually look like bugs. That way, they can move it around in a structure from place to place. Uh, unless you actually see it, they've got some that's supposed to pretend to be dead. They, you know, roll over and lay on their back, you know, during the daylight. So, you know, who messes with a bug unless you're kind of a neat freak? But the devices, they're so small nowadays that they're trying to make them more and more portable. So you'll actually have a beetle that will be listening to you. The beetles listen to you. <laughs> okay, uh, see. Anyway, so that covers that. Human intelligence gathering. These are spies. Um, person who secretly collects and reports information on activities, movements, and plans of an enemy or competitor. Now, when we have spies, that's a great thing. When they have spies spying on us, those are the worst people on earth. <laughs> Funny how that hypocrisy goes. Um, some people don't even realize that they uh, are spies. You know, the um, Russian government is really great at corrupting people into doing what they think is a fairly harmless thing. And uh, it turns out to be fairly nightmarish afterwards. So as far as the Army goes, I'm not sure about the Air Force, they basically run a course twice a year to get us to understand the techniques that the, the Russian government primarily uses to be able to get information out of you. Okay. Uh, see, but, but that's basically spies. Can't live with them, can't live without them. Okay. Infiltration. They come at night. Mostly, okay, these are the guys that uh, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want these jobs. Um, but uh, bottom line is, uh, there's two uh, episodes in history that has occurred in 1976. Um, the Israelis, the IDF, flew uh, to over Lake Victoria. They landed on Entebbe Airport. Um, they had a raid, uh, and they rescued 102 hostages that were hijacked off of an Air France flight and brought to Uganda. Um, they lost one person who was killed in action, who was the uh, brother, the big brother of Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, and uh, they had uh, three wounded and um, two hostages, were, uh, three hostages were killed. Uh, they had assumed because one person, a woman named Dora Block, she was taken to the hospital before the raid occurred. She was never seen again. So Idi Amin, he, you know, bad guy. He's dead. So the world is a little bit better. But, uh, you know, anyway, that was a successful raid. We, on the other hand, while I was in uh, Spain, we were doing an operation there for the first time NATO was uh, letting Spain into the clubhouse. We were doing an operation in Spain, and for whatever reason, they stopped us. They told us to just kind of hold in place. For about an hour and a half, two hours, we did nothing, just sitting there. They stopped the game. We didn't know why. Up until a few days later, when we got on the aircraft to head back to Italy, they basically told us that um, there was a rescue attempt for the 52 hostages in Tehran, and we were actually going to be a part of that. We were supposed to parachute onto a soccer field, and there were many, many, many problems with that. Um, but ultimately, it was called Desert One. We had nine service members killed, four were wounded, one helo and one C-130 was completely destroyed. Five helos were abandoned uh, in the uh, desert due to uh, malfunctions and weather. Everything went wrong on that. 
Um, but I mean, it was actually kind of slim that it would have worked in the first place. Because, and again, we found out what we did wrong and we started to correct that. And part of that correction was we came out with something called SOCOM, Special Operations Command. The Marines, the Air Force, the uh, Army, and elements of the Navy were all, they all had their hands in that pie. And it turned out to be a really horrible pie. They have never worked together before. They didn't know the strengths and weaknesses of the others. And it just went to hell from the very, very beginning. So we don't do that anymore. They, we now have a new mission statement. It is to oh, it goes. Um, enter under covert means specifically targeting locations in a region to observe target areas. This stuff takes a while to do. Okay, So this is not one of those things like in the movies where they just jump in, you know, run 200 yards, you know, pull out the binoculars, take a look at the target, and you know, shoot the bad guy. This takes planning and discipline. Um, to provide overwatch of critical military installations, logistic sites, or prob probable drop zones for much larger follow-on forces. To eliminate key enemy opposition, weapon systems, or facilities which may interfere with the follow-on forces. To extract friendly personnel from hostile areas before, during, or after combat operations, no, rescues. And to keep clandestine operation, observation of weapons of mass destruction and chemical plants likely not to be attacked. In other words, we, we don't blow up the baby factory if everybody working there has gas masks. You know, so, um, so but bottom line is they don't want to be seen. Why SEAL Team 6 keeps getting thrown in the news, I have no idea, but that's completely ass backwards to the whole policy of clandestine. You know, um, With this, though, so we came out with Special Operations Command, SOCOM. Um, what these guys do, they practice this kind of stuff together. These are the SWAT teams of the United States military. So the Special Air Force guys are going to be working with the same commandos. They have the same level of training. Um, they do a lot of cross-training, cross-chatter. They have their own aircraft. They have their own radio systems. They have, likely have their own satellites. You know, these guys are more high speed and low drag than you can imagine. Um, but uh, they're fully capable of uh, doing operations around the world to, uh, to basically save our people or to... They're that foot in the door for any combat operations. Yeah, to keep them from closing the door, they, they stick their foot in there. Anyway, but um, this is what SOCOM is made to do. Now, I've heard from time to time, and it's a little old, uh, the uh, question about Benghazi, the ambassador. We're good. We're not that good. Okay, from, and I've done the uh, preparation uh, timeline from the 82nd. If everything went perfectly, we could be over um, Benghazi in 17 hours. The airborne battalion in Italy, they could probably be there in six to seven hours if everything went right. The man was dead in an hour and a half. Nothing that we could have done would have made any difference. We don't have the Starship Enterprise where we can just beam down. Everything that we do, even though it may seem easy, this takes years of practice and training. You know, it's not just something unless some terrorist uh, comes out on a military base where they're actually having a live fire. You know, we have to basically be able to react, and it takes time. Again, we can do a lot of stuff, but nobody's that good. Um, the, unfortunately, the ambassador, he put himself in a very, very bad position. If you guys ever spend any time in the Middle East, it's a dangerous place for Americans there. Don't let people realize you're an American. My advice is don't go into the Middle East. Okay? So, again, these guys are good, but, you know, they couldn't have done any better. He, the man was dead in an hour and a half. The, um, the problems with that would have been if we... It, with the 82nd, we parachuted in. Then what? We have no idea where we are. We do not speak the language. We need to coordinate with people who are on the ground already. We would be lost. We would basically, we'd have no idea what we're doing. We don't know who the enemy are. We have not a clue. We have things called operation orders that cover all of this stuff. With the information that we had, none of this stuff would have been covered. We don't like to go into black holes. If we go any place, we know what's going to be there when we get there. And we are prepared for it. So there is none of this John Wayne stuff or you know, Bruce Willis or, well, actually that one that he was in with the Tears of the Sun. Well, it was actually pretty good. Um, but it takes time. 
Uh, we just can't just, you know, load a plane with paratroopers or commandos and take off and jump out and everything's going to be, you know, roses. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so with these guys, SEALs. These guys were made specifically out of the uh, underwater demolition scene. The UDT uh, started after World War II with the British as well as the Americans. Their job is to assault from the oceans. They can also parachute in as well. Um, they also have some pretty cool uh, ground vehicles too, some cool R RVs with uh, electric Gatling guns. Um, we have the Green Berets, one of my guys. Uh, initially set up as trainers for non conventional warfare and to train our allies to kidnap, sabotage, taskings, working on their own. They learned during the time of Vietnam to be able to work with the Montem Yards. And that's one of the things that they do is they, they are that first American representative they see carrying a rifle. Everybody else is a diplomat. These guys, they're kind of a diplomat, a cross between diplomats and soldiers. Okay, so they use their brains. Most of the time they speak different languages. They have special skills. They set up hospitals. All right? They do everything they can to get the community on the side of the U.S. We're putting our best foot forward with these, these guys. So when they routinely have gone into areas, it's not their job to pull out their weapons and start shooting at everything in sight. Okay. Delta Force. These guys came out in November 19th, 1977. Their primary job was anti-terrorists. This was kind of inspired uh, with the, uh, the uh, taking of the uh, Israeli athletes in Munich. Okay. The United States realized we needed to have a team that can be mobilized at a moment's notice, go in quiet, take out the targets, leave nobody alive, well, except for the hostages. Uh, but it's patterned after the British SAS. Uh, Ernie, what branch did they come from? Army. I, and as a matter of fact, I actually put in my paperwork for them. Not that I wanted to actually get into Delta Force. I was actually trying to stop going to Egypt so I could fill out my paperwork to go to flight school. But, you know, they, uh, one of the training methods that they have, they have you, they don't tell you which one is until you finish the first one. So the first one was I had to swim uh, four laps in a swimming pool in full uniform without splashing. Um, the next one was uh, to do a seven mile road march in with uh, something like a 60 pound rucksack in a period of about two hours. Um, the next one, and again, they don't tell you, the next one was to do a 110 mile land nav over a period of three days in Virginia. At that point I said, you know what, I'll just go to Egypt. So, but um, they're so tough that if you have an accidental discharge with your weapon, there is no question about it, you're out. Doesn't matter if it's a live round or a blank, you're out of Delta Force. So it's very, very tough to get into that that field. Rangers, I was a paratrooper. These guys, we go, when we go in, it's a brawl. These guys, they go in, it's very, very quiet. The kind of jobs that they'd have would be, for example, to uh, fly a spaceship on the indoor moon and take out the uh, generator that powers the shield, you know, so that the entire attack can occur. The Rangers, uh, 75th Ranger Battalion, these guys do some of the scariest and toughest jobs, but when they go in, it's not a secret. You're going to know they're there because things are going to go boom. And there's going to be a lot of screaming and running and stuff like that. They are very fast at moving around the world. With the 82nd, we have a lot more equipment than they do, so it takes us a little bit longer. But uh, we do much of the same tasks they do. They just do it faster. And it took me a while to find out exactly what the heck these guys do. <laughs> Talk to people in the Air Force. They don't know what they do. You know, but apparently the term Air Force Special Operations Command applies mostly to the aircraft that they fly. And this would be something like Spectre or um, the one that basically comes down with the scissors on the nose, the Talon, C-130 Talon, and it snatches people up off the ground. They're the ones who will come in clandestinely and drop people off in the middle of the night. Um, from 35,000 feet. They're the ones who do the stuff that nobody in the world would be caught dead doing. They're real warriors. Yeah. But they, they fly. Now, these guys, 
They're uh, operating a ground laser identifier, obviously for marking targets for laser, uh, laser system strikes. Thing is, the Rangers do that, the Green Berets can do that, Delta Force, everybody does that. So why they're on the ground, that's still a bit of a mystery. Yes, sir? To control the air? There, there are traffic controllers on the ground, basically. Well, when you're, it would appear to me, and I have no doubt that 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 is true, but it would appear to me that if you're coming in and you have bombs and uh, high caliber weapons, you're going to pretty much fly wherever the heck you want to. Um, they do have C-130s landing on very short uh, improvised strips, and, and I've been doing that kind of thing. That's a lot of fun. Um, but anyway, like I said, most of the guys I've spoken with from the Air Force, nobody could really tell me much about them other than the flying side, but you're absolutely right. They basically set up air operations in clandestine positions. So, Marines, Marine Special Operations Command, they're the new guys on the block. Um, the bottom line with uh, all of these guys is that it would basically appear, again, on the surface, everybody wants to be a part of the Special Operations community. The SEALs, they'll come in and they'll do stuff that the Ranger would do, the Marines would do things that the SEALs would do. So, everybody pretty much can do the same job. Of course, there are those specialties of coming up from a sub 90 feet below. So, but again, uh, everybody wants to get their feet in the Now the Marines, September 7th, 2015, out of Camp Lejeune, that's when they started this, because they didn't have anybody in SOCOM. Now they do. Uh, and they also have the addition of uh, additional mission of counterterrorism and information uh, operations, that's called psychological warfare, where they, we don't use the term torture, torture is bad. We don't torture people. We coerce them to tell us what we want to know. <laughs> Methods of insertion. You have high altitude, low opening, that's halo. High altitude, high opening, that's hey ho. The C-130 Hercules and uh, the uh, Osprey. Now, stop it on that one. The Osprey was actually needed badly throughout the decades. We needed an aircraft that could bring in a strike force from more than a thousand miles away with no friendly airfields to come to a spot in total darkness, uh, insert a team or extract a team and get out un unknown, unseen. That's why we bought the Osprey. Now, of course, we are branching out in the conventional military, so, you know, things do change. But uh, that is the reason why the Osprey came to fruition. Um, we have submarine insertions and covert transports, or other than military transports. And basically what that is, is just short of getting an Uber. It's the guys who are, you know, coming in in civilian clothes. They're driving in on, in somebody's car who's giving them a lift. They know the area. You know, the person who's giving them the list, they're like a partisan or, in other words, a spy. Um, but they're not coming in in uniform. They're not coming in uh, in any military vehicle. Their whole uh, job is to sit up, set up in maybe a crappy hotel and overwatch a target. Again, baby milk factory where they're making, you know, they have gas masks on. So that's basically the methods of coming in. Now, when you're talking about jumping, this is one of the toughest schools in the military, Halo. Um, you got a lot of people who fail out of this because if you cannot control that parachute, and your equipment on the descent and rendezvous with your team members, you're not going to make it. They're basically going to say, thank you for trying, you have to go. And it may have something to do with their musculature. If you're too muscular, too bulky, you become a flying wing. Um, there's basically certain people who can't do this, but they'll give you the opportunity to try if you want to do it. It's just it takes a very long time. Uh, it's a very expensive course. And um, again, no real expectations of passing. It's a handful of people who actually make it here. Uh, it requires pre-breathing between 30 to 45 minutes. Um, what you're breathing right now is a combination of nitrogen, about 78%, uh, 21% oxygen, and an argon. When you change uh, air pressures rapidly, those uh, nitrogen bubbles start to come out of the solution in the blood, and it can cause you to have the bends. You can basically have an aneurysm. It can basically infirm you if it doesn't kill you. So they have to slap an oxygen mask on their face and breathe in uh, for up to 45 minutes. And if that mask comes off, you got to start all over again. So if the mask falls off, stop breathing. Get the strap fixed while you're holding your breath. Well, 
hopefully you won't you know fall on the floor from lack of oxygen. Um, other issues with that? Are these free fall? Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Halo again, high altitude, low opening, so they're coming in from between thirty to thirty-five thousand feet. So they have to be on oxygen, and they'll open up low. And this all depends upon the tactical situation at the time. Hey ho, we're going to show you a picture. That is pretty cool. Um, um, but you know, the other problems associated with that is um, just like the B-17, the temperature can drop down to minus 50 degrees in that aircraft. So once they open up those ramps, you, they want to get them out of there as fast as possible because it's cold outside. Um, anyway, so next one. Some of the equipment that you drop with. And again, all of this stuff causes you to fall at odd angles. You, know, you could start tumbling. You have to control this stuff. Um, before you get up enough speed. The vast majority of these jumps, in fact, if not all of them, will be done at night. These guys use what's called uh, ranger lights or chem lights. They'll put them on the back of their helmets, on the back of their pads, so that you won't be able to see it if you're looking up. But if you're coming down to uh, you know, your team members, you can actually see them in the distance as you're closing on them. But this is the kind of material. Now these guys, they're gonna be on the ground for easily over a week. So they got to have everything that they need with them to last that long. They're going to hit the ground. They're going to get to the uh, objective area to observe it. They're going to start digging a hole, and they'll camouflage that, and that's where they stay. I won't say anything about how they use the bathroom and all of that. Just let me just say it's probably not something that you want to do. Halo and hey ho. Okay, this is all basically just uh, fun stuff, although it's all military, but the same type of thing. They don't do these jumps in the daytime. This is practice. We used to call this Hollywood jumps, where you don't generally have a lot of combat equipment. The stuff that I carried on me before a jump, uh, it weighed somewhere in the neighborhood. Everything all pulled together with the backpack, the reserve, uh, the weapons kit, the weapons case, uh, everything told together. I stood on a scale uh, before I, I weighed 190 pounds. When I stood on the scale, I weighed 283 pounds. So they practice this in the daytime, of course. This shot here, this is one of the best examples. This individual has obviously jumped out at a high altitude. These are clouds below him. Very difficult to tell how high he actually started this. But one thing that you would notice here, that's a computer, a navigation computer. It allows him to find the objective area. He's still on oxygen, so he's well over 14, 15,000 feet. The idea of this kind of an insertion is so that they can float up to 40 miles from the exit point. So if the objective area has some kind of a radar system, a good radar system, they're going to see a C-130 coming in at 35,000 feet um, over their territory. But if you can jump out over across the border, they won't pay any attention to that because the plane is not going to slow down. He's just going to keep flying at 30 to 35,000 feet. They won't pay him any attention. These guys deploy, again, in total darkness you're not going to know they're there. Looks fun though, doesn't it? <laughs> this is uh, at night. Guys on pre-breathing, um, checking out the, uh, the uh, drop zone area. Um, a lot of this stuff, it could be at uh, 15,000 feet, but you get the gist. For about 30 to 45 minutes, they're sitting here like this, doing nothing but breathing. They're not really talking to one another, although they have communication systems in the helmets. They don't want to run the batteries unless they absolutely have to. Um, but all of this stuff is night operations as well as this. Cool view. And that's the outcome. Um, while I was at uh, New Orleans Naval Air Station, I was running around their uh, runway. It was about um, say four in the morning. And uh, I could hear this fluttering sound and I look up and I see this dark parachute going over the top of me. That was a SEAL and a couple of others. I was wearing an army um, flight suit, or uh, flight suit, an army sweatsuit, so they paid me no attention. You know, the one guy, he hit the ground, he got up, he looked in my direction, he's got an MP5 already out and he goes, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> they, they were doing an exercise to see how long the Air Force, uh, the uh, Navy security, uh, before they even noticed they were there. Okay, uh, let's see. C-130 Hercules, they bought these puppies in uh, 1954, uh, max speed of 374 miles an hour. The big joke with these was that the C-130 doesn't have an airspeed indicator, it has a calendar. <laughs> As a paratrooper, I can tell you, 
this is our mode of transport that we love. Now, I've never jumped the C-17. That came in before um, before I uh, got, a, got a chance to get on it. Uh, I was already in the flight school program before they started parachuting with the C-17. They could fill that thing, but I've been all over the world in this thing. And yeah, it might be slow. It might be noisy. doesn't have its own toilet. But when we're told, after you've been in a country... Norway being one of them, it was cold out there. Again, we were on the ice planet of Hoth. You know, they're telling us if they say a 141 is coming in to pick us up on Tuesday, nobody got, you know, thrilled about it. Because it may be there, it may not be there. But if they say Tuesday at 8.20 in the morning, C-130s will be there at 8.15, you're hearing this thrumming of these engines. Huh. They will be there. Those are the best planes that the Air Force bought as far as the Army goes. We parachute from these things, we drop equipment from these things. We do what's called lakes, low altitude parachute extraction, where they basically skim right over the top of a road, they'll push out a load, and it slides along the ground. Chow's here. They can drop all of our equipment like that, our Humvees. Uh, they even put in one Sheridan tank, an M551 Sheridan. Unfortunately, that was a fatal accident. Um, if you ever see the video of that, the pilot just came in really steep. But... There's nothing that these things won't do. Yeah, I've done combat, sir. Does the radar signature change at all when you open the ramp? Uh, I probably, I, I would doubt it. They're just seeing a, you're talking about enemy radar? Yeah. Yeah, I, I doubt it. All I see is an airplane, you know. I mean, when this thing flew around, it's supposedly, you know, less than a tenth of its actual size, but they can still see it. Uh, but they wouldn't pay that much attention. As I said, when you exit the aircraft, the aircraft doesn't change speeds. All they do is open the door and say, get out. You know, this is your stop. Yes, sir. Are they pressurized? Oh, oh, yeah, up until that drop, you know, for special ops. Once they drop below uh, 14,000 feet, you can breathe on your own. Most of the time, they'll drop it below 12,000 feet if you have an oxygen situation. Um, but uh, once you go above 14,000 feet, you've got to be either in a pressurized aircraft or have breathers. All right, um, anyway, so with this thing as well, it's um, four turboprop engines for short takeoffs and landings from unprepared dirt strips. They've even landed, and you can see it on a video, there's a C-130 that landed on the deck of an aircraft carrier, not one of the newer ones, one of the older ones, I think it was a Forestal, and they had painted on the front of it, look, Ma, no hooks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a uh, versatile and flexible design with 60 years in production. They're still making these things. Used by the Air Force, Marine Corps, Army, and, I'm sorry, Coast Guard, and the Navy. Uh, they have over 2,100 built with variants uh, that are just too norm numerous to, li uh, to list here. Um, the AC-130 Spectre, um, which I'm more familiar with, this guy, that's oh, a nice shot. This guy, they started modifying this thing. For years, they basically had two 20-millimeter Vulcans, two 40-millimeter Bofors, and a 105-millimeter howitzer, an actual howitzer, a cannon in the back of this thing. And if you have never seen this thing, it flies around in a large circle. It's got a targeting sight here. It used to be a targeting reticle in the pilot's window as he's making that turn. He's got a ballistic solution that lines up two crosses. When he lines up those crosses, he can fire the, uh, the cannon um, and the guns. But he used those. Right now, they're using this targeting, uh, looks like a FLIR blister here. They've got two Gatling guns here. They've got one, it looks like a 40 millimeter um, rocket launcher, or sorry, um, 40 millimeter cannon, and still the old classic 105 millimeter howitzer. This thing flies only in low-intensity conflicts. If you have an anti-aircraft weapon system, a gun or anything like that, he ain't going to be around. This is primarily for, again, special ops guys who are on the ground and they're having a real hard time with the neighbors. You know, a friend of mine, the Ranger Zavatsky, uh, during Panama, he got a chance to call one of these things in. And he basically said that they're trying not to kill anybody they don't have trying to get the Commandancia to surrender. This is nothing personal. It's, you know, Noriega. So they have our, their interpreters. Now, we've gone down there for jungle school. You know, I was a jungle expert as well. Oh, yeah, that's what I got, jungle expert badge. Um, we've been going down there for years. Um, so we don't want to kill anybody that we don't actually have to. The interpreter 
basically called out on the loudspeakers, stay out of the northwest corner of the building. It's a two-story building made out of concrete. Stay out of the northwest corner. Specter came in through an overcast sky. Zavatsky said all he saw was a stream of tracers coming out of the clouds and moving, but they were hitting the exact same spot as they're moving. It carved that concrete building down to powder in that corner. They surrendered. Wow. It is an amazing machine. When um, The first time I've ever seen this thing on Fort Bragg, they were firing on the range. Every weapon they had, you basically just see tracers coming out of the sky. Yes, sir. Do they have an automatic loading mechanism for the howitzer, or is there somebody no. back there? No, there, there, no. there's people what in there. There's people right. yeah. there it, it has a pretty good rate of fire, but all the other weapons, yeah, that one, no. Um, that would just be bigger and not necessary. 105 millimeter rounds are not that heavy. I mean, if you're going to load them constantly. But in the case of this one, it's really amazing to see at night. Um, and you're just seeing this fire coming out of the sky. You can see flashing on the ground in the distance. You don't know exactly what they're targeting, but it was pretty impressive at, you know, 8.39 p.m. Come around 2 a.m., you just want them to go away. They just stayed up there constantly. Wah, woo, woo. Wow, for over five hours, these guys were doing that. So they've got a lot of firepower with that thing. Anyway, they've started to uh, fashion it. It's run by the um, reserves right now. Uh, there are different versions out there. They're, they're just kind of mixing and matching them right now. Yes, sir? To counter the firing of the cannon, they kick the rubber ducks, correct? I don't know. No, that's what they do. Oh. I worked with them when we did the soccer match at Rocky in the 80s. Oh, cool. And it kicks the rubber in the opposite direction. And it's one of five fire. Huh. And it's good old Kentucky Derby. Huh. All they use. Well, now they've got, I've never seen this targeting system before, so yes. maybe they've. That, that was that fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, this, the, the compensation that they, they have for some of the stuff, even the Cobra. At a hover, when you fire off that minigun, it'll actually push the helicopter backwards, but it won't do that with the 20 millimeter. So, and it's not supposed to push it backwards. So, Jesse, the body Ventura, and Predator. Yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. This guy here, again, he was at the call for an aircraft that can operate special operations warfare. It came out for this thing. Um, first flew in 87, purchased in uh, 2007, so it had a long time in research and development. There were some accidents that occurred, but you know what? That's going to happen. You know, um, it's, a very, it's a different machine. It's a hybrid, so people have to get used to flying this thing. I mean, every aircraft had a, an accident or two, so even this thing. Um, flown by the Marines, the Air Force, and the Navy, carries 24 troops, 20,000 pounds, of equipment or 15,000 pounds on the cargo hook. I didn't even know it had a cargo hook. Yes, it does. Um, range is just slightly over a thousand miles. It can go up as high as 25,000 feet. Uh, unfortunately, plagued with cost overruns, the $73 million, it survived the Congressional Acts and uh, cannot outlift the C 53 Super C Stallion, which is what it technically was supposed to replace. But again, it flies further than a sea stallion. It can operate better than that. So, you know what? You just got to take your wins where you can. Um, also, it was uh, pushed uh, through after the Desert One incident where we lost all those people. Uh, let see. Last but not least. Oh, the picture's there. It is so quiet. Until it's flying. I know I knew it. I, I live in Hemet. I keep hearing this thrumming sound. And I run to my balcony and try my best not to fall over. Um, it, it's a cool machine. I've never flown with it or on it. I've only seen it at air shows. Uh, I think that uh, over time, as they make sure everything works just as right. Now, they're talking about buying a new one called uh, V-222 Vigilant for the Army. Looks pretty much the same. It's uh, technically a little bit smaller. They're saying it's supposed to replace the Blackhawks. I'll believe it when I see it. Guys are waiting for a ride. Uber didn't work for them. Um, obviously, this is the SEALs. They uh, have modified uh, attack submarines to be able to hold on to these garages here, which has their uh, equipment and their SEAL delivery vehicle in there. This is the Mark 8 SEAL delivery vehicle. 
they are having issues with this thing. Supposedly, it will go 125 miles at 8 miles an hour. Supposedly, it has oxygen systems in there so you don't have to breathe in off of your tank. Supposedly, it has a forward-looking and sideward-looking sonar so you don't hit things along the way. I would rather wait for an Uber. But that's just me. Uh, but anyway, um, if you think this looks difficult, try to doing it at night. Okay. You can't see anything. I've been night diving before. It's a black hole out there. I didn't particularly like it. The guy I was with, he was just drunk. Anyway, so uh, as far as the other thing, um, covert transportation. Bottom line is we have operatives in countries all around the world, and that's all that they're talking about there. They're not coming in by military transport. They're not parachuting out there catching a train somewhere somebody's going to meet him at the uh, train station so but it is a way for them to get in and the entire part of this is you don't want to attract attention you don't even want to look like a tourist that's why some of the guys from delta force years ago they usually had beards they didn't look like americans okay? they had long hair you know, delta force that and i guys so you the whole time is you know you're going to go into a area that is not known to have Americans there or Europeans there. You don't want to go in there looking like an American or European when there's hostile forces in power. You know, it kind of makes you stand out. So, yeah, response, okay, yeah, anyway. Action of getting a team of operations specialists inside the country via any method other than military, yada, yada. Principally, this would be done uh, using simple as a uh, car, truck, public transportation to move around the country for the purpose of observation, observation, we're watching, observation, marking and or confirming the target uh, facilities at the location and status of key personnel at the last minute. You can see what looked like Osama bin Laden from a drone, but it only works well if you can actually see him from the ground. So these things can do some amazing things, but to be able to identify a person uh, by you know, their face, uh, birthmarks, whatever. We can't do it with those as well. These guys here with the M1A1 eyeball, that's what they're asking for. So they basically just kind of stalk the guy. They watch him. You know? But uh, they have to basically come in by operatives or civilians who are working in that country who are not friendly to that uh, country's government. Okay, the buildup. Uh, examine threat array and selection of combat platforms, move resources into position, fuel and arm, and some marshaling plan, and commitment of forces time to go. We've gotten beyond the part where we're observing, we're getting to the part where we're actually getting ready to move in. So, first part, um, you got to examine the, the array. you got to know what they have. Um, for the most part, um, again, this is what I used to do. We used to do gaming. Uh, to find out how do we fight wars in other countries. So they would basically pick a region. we take uh, two days to be able to get all that resource together. This is basically what we did. Um, using everything through space and high altitude platforms isn't enough. Requires people on the ground. News reports of up the, the last 100 days. You have to know if there are any changes that have occurred in either the government, uh, the leadership. Um, it'll most likely be in the newspaper. Interview of persons who previously lived there. Uh, regional threat matrix of friend and foe. So not specifically that country, but the countries adjoining it. So we got to know, for example, we're going to do operations in um, uh, against Iraq. Are the Jordanians going to be on our side? You know, stuff like that. We don't want to put people in harm's way if absolutely um, can be avoided. Um, during the Entebbe operation, um, Somalia allowed the Israelis to land in um a couple of days later, Idi Amin killed about a thousand Somalis. Retribution. Again, he's a, he's a dick. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, plans are already made, and that's part of the gaming system that we do. We have these very, very elaborate uh, computer uh, operated game systems where we have resources in the country. We've got to move them from point A to point B. Uh, there will be problems that occur, and we have to figure out how to get around those kinds of problems. Now, I'm not sure about the Air Force. Uh, but the Army, we are generally planning on total disaster. Everybody does great when everything runs great, but when things go wrong, you need to know how your people are going to respond. So we go under the assumption that everything is going to go wrong. Everything will fail when it 
needs to work, so we need to have a plan B, a plan C, a plan C1. Terrain and weather, big part of this. Okay, so for example, here, you have Saudi Arabia here. There are friends, Iraq, not so friendly. Again, Jordan, they're sympathetic to the United States. I again, this takes time to really understand the true dynamics of what's going on around here. These guys, they hate our guts. So uh, we got to know about uh, the what's going on in the Persian Gulf, in the Red Sea. Learn how to dive right there. Um, and the Mediterranean Sea. Everything uh, that can influence what occurs there or what we're going to do that that will influence our operations. We have to know in advance and we have to plan in advance to make sure that we are not left out in the cold. There have been enough failures uh, with not just this country, but every country planning this kind of stuff in the past. There was a uh, really interesting thing that happened with um, dogs that were trained to go underneath Russian tanks by the Germans with a mine attached to them. They, were, they put the food bowls underneath Russian built tanks and uh, it, it seemed to work good. They knew exactly, they didn't know, of course, they have a bomb on their back, but it was uh, supposed to set it off when they walked underneath the Russian-built tank. The problem was, in real life, when the gunfire and explosion went off, the dogs ran right back to their handlers with those bombs on them. So, uh, the greater plans of mice and men sometimes go awry. All right, so, out there. Okay, go. Okay. Move resources into position. Now, this is incredibly elaborate. This is the buildup of the Desert Storm. Um, the air bridge was composed of C-130s, 141s, C-5s, KC-10s, and KC-135s. They also had civilian contract aircraft. This is not something that you can just plan on a whim. We already have contracts with a lot of these uh, airline agencies to be able to move these people. It's not a time to start negotiating. Um, sea bridge, the uh, Navy and the Marine Corps, they're always there. We also have the merchant marines and some civilian shipping. Um, the Queen Elizabeth, I think, out of uh, England was actually used to move soldiers to the Falkland Islands, one of their, their larger ocean liners. Ground transport, buses, trains, and uh, trucks. Anything that has wheels or tracks that can move. The whole idea is you have to send 700,000 people from here to there. And you have all of that stuff to work with. Now, this all takes time. Okay, This is a marshalling plan. The marshalling plan is, what are you going to do when you get there? What do they do as soon as they get there? How are they going to get out to disperse? Because the last thing you need is 700,000 people at an airport. Um, so they got to find places for these people to go. Um, they hopefully will have friendly foreign bases and airfields. We can put a lot of people on the airfields. Uh, to acclimate to the area and begin training and rehearsal for upcoming conflict. Sleeping under the stars, as far as you know, soldiers go, we can sleep pretty much anywhere. Um, or under their vehicles or in their vehicles. Food, water, communications, medical support, garbage disposal. Again, 700,000 people. You've moved a moderate-sized city thousands and thousands of miles, and you can't tell me you don't have enough bathrooms. It's going to be a problem. So this is what is planned in advance. Inspect and prepare uh, and arm all equipment and remedy the shortages. That is the last thing you go do before you actually start the conflict. Now the question is, what if the enemy attacks during this phase? <laughs> They're already there. <laughs> so, oh yeah. This is a uh, strike eagle, by the way. Oh, wow. Anyway, combat air patrol. Cap uh, typically entails fighters flying tactical patterns around and screening for defensive targets while looking for incoming attackers. Effective cap patterns may include aircraft positions at both high and low altitudes. This gives them a radar aspect uh, difference of um, you know being able to look up at a target as opposed to looking down at a target. And we do have the F-15 Eagle has a spectacular sh look down shoot down capability with their radar system. Um, and this is the big thing here that doesn't get a whole lot of credit. The AWACS plane, ground uh, controller, not so much. I mean, that's a fixed, uh, fixed position. AWACS, though, he is, if you're not familiar, he's the tattletale of the battlefield. He's the one going, they're over there, they're over there, they're trying to sneak around on you, they're over, you know. Um, unfortunately, um, from what I've gathered, they've had aircraft that, they did not identify friend or foe. They do not assume, depending upon the tactical situation, that they are bad guys. So they want the 
fast movers to be able to get close enough to ID them, that's generally a bad thing to do. But you don't want to flame out a friendly. But the uh, processors on board this aircraft can track innumerable targets at to ranges that are classified top secret. Um, if it's in the air, they're going to see it. Um, they just may not know what it is. And there are times when pilots are told, when in doubt, fire. But that doesn't happen a whole lot. The last thing you want to do is kill an allied uh, aircraft uh, with a pilot as well. Uh, let's see. Go for it. So anyway, they, uh, the Navy has their version. It's the E-2C Hawkeye. Um, same thing. It's one of the first aircraft launched off of the uh, aircraft carrier. Now, the thing about these guys is the aircraft carrier has tons of defensive weapons, and it has a lot of radar. During most combat operations, the radar is off. You don't know where that aircraft carrier is. What this guy will do is he will fly out two, three hundred miles away, and he'll do exactly the same thing the AWACS does. He vectors in the fighters for their kills. He monitors the entire airspace. He actually does uh, listening as well. Um, let's see. Detect and track targets, distinguish between friendly and uh, hostile aircraft. And because of its mobility, this is both of them, it's much less vulnerable to counterattack. He's behind F-15s and such. Okay, but the whole point of these guys is they basically just make it life really hard on the bad guys. J-Stars, these are relatively new. During the first Gulf War, these things were actually being uh, evaluated for purchase. And Saddam Hussein, all this stuff popped up. They said, hey, put in some more gas. Bring it out here. You can have new use for them. This tracks ground targets. Um, they actually saw a convoy of vehicles moving towards... Uh, Cutter? No, there's a small town. Um, they didn't know that they were there before, but there was a Marine detachment there, and without these guys letting them know, they would have been caught with their pants down. They didn't have any way, the Marines didn't have a way of getting out of the area before this large convoy of Iraqis came in. The J-Stars saw them. They alerted uh, Corps headquarters, who alerted the Marines, who were basically, they found positions to hide and wait it out. Uh, and then um, the Qataris actually came in and they pushed the Iraqis out. But we had a detachment of Marines there as kind of an early warning. So the early warning helped our early warning guys. But uh, they're called J-Stars. There's Army personnel on this aircraft as well. I'm sure the Air Force doesn't love that. But, um, you know, it was a neighborhood. Uh, but it's basically a ground surveillance radar system, and it also has synthetic aperture radar, so it can actually make 3D models of whatever is on the ground. You know, be it a hilltop, be it an ant mound, be it an enemy truck. Now, when we're talking about uh, the buildup going in into Saudi Arabia here, um, as well as uh, Oman, we had people here uh, in, in everywhere except Kuwait City. We had a lot of aircraft in these areas on the ground. We had people on the ground flown into Saudi Arabia. If they had tried to send any aircraft south, we've got the uh, combat air patrols flying traffic patterns out here. They would have seen them easily uh, by the time they left the ground. And they would have vectored in the nearest set of eagles or you know whatever the Germans have or anybody else to be able to take them out of the sky before they even reach the border. As soon as they cross the border, that's pretty much about it, they're gone. Um, so we have surveillance in the entire area by these aircraft. Cannot get over that. Uh, let's see. F-15 Eagle, just gonna highlight these real quick. Uh, kind of expected a lot more civilians here who didn't know what this stuff was, so I had to walk them through that. Um, in service with uh, a lot of nations, it has the highest kill ratio of any other aircraft in existence. By the time that this, uh, these stats were put together, it was 2008, they already had 102 kills, zero losses. Uh, they had some that were damaged uh, in a fight in some way or another, um, but ultimately anything that went up against an F-15 Eagle died. So um, They right now have um, 15 kills achieved by the Israeli Air Force. More, the Israelis have killed more targets with the F-15 than we have. So we learned from that. Some of the information with it. Old aircraft, 1976, replaced the F-4. Mach 2.5 is its a high altitude speed. I have no idea why they have a low altitude here. Combat radius over 1,000 miles. Ferry range, 
with these new conformal tanks is getting around 3,000 miles service ceiling, 65,000 feet. It can take nine Gs and also the only uh, aircraft on record to shoot down a satellite. We're not doing that again. This is a Strike Eagle. The difference between the two, other than the paint scheme, the Strike Eagle is darker than the uh, standard Eagle. Uh, the airspeed is basically about the same. It has more powerful engines though. The reason being is it's got a lot of drag on here. It has a targeting system here for flying as well as laser designating targets. It's primarily a ground strike aircraft. He flies incredibly low. During the uh, engagement in Desert Storm, the very first aircraft across the line, not talking about the uh, F-117 Stealth with these guys and the uh, F-1 EF-111 Ravens. Um, but they have a more powerful engine. Their speed is not appreciably more than the standard F-15C. Um, service ceiling, 60,000 feet. They've just got a lot more stuff hanging off of this plane. So the drag has increased. They're now starting to build them all with these conformal tanks. That's the F-15 line as well as the F-16 line. And I'm pretty sure the uh, Hornets are going to go that way as well. All it is is it gives them a little more flying time. Not a bad idea. A couple of shots of it from beneath. Um, these are fixed sighting systems. So if you ever see one of these things, um, they're not going to take these things off when they take the uh, ordnance off. They stay with the aircraft. Um, but uh, designed in the 80s for long-range, high-speed interdiction. Um, mention the color. Formal tanks. Back seat. Okay, this guy in the back seat, fella here, um, he's not only working the uh, targeting systems, working the navigations, keeping track of the aircraft's st status, he is... Uh, also able to fly it from the back seat. That's something that the F-14 Tomcat didn't do. Um, the F-15 Wild Weasel, they did have controls in the rear, did they not? So, only the Navy is the one who said, yeah, I'm the pilot, he's not. Um, <laughs> so, he's called a Wizzo. Uh, it's, like I said, it's a relatively new aircraft. He's got multiple screens for displaying information uh, for radar, electronic warfare, thermographic cameras. Uh, you can monitor the system status as well as he selects the targets and he uses electric electronic moving map to navigate with. Nice little thing. Very expensive. Early, early, uh, little known fact is the F-15 was the first new airplane to completely be built by CAD CAD. By who? Computer-aided design, oh. computer-aided manufacturing. Whoa. They threw out all the old methods of making plaster molds and all this. Right. And the plane was built from the same computer file that it was designed to. They did a good job. Now, there's something that, now, it, it, it is the king of the sky, but there's another wrinkle here. This guy. Okay. There is a website. It is um, on YouTube. You can look it up. Uh, if you're really curious, one F-22 versus five F-15s, real dogfight, shocking result. These are Air Force pilots who are telling you what happened during these mock engagements. Obviously, we're not going to put real missiles on these things and send them after F-15s. But one of the comments, because they want every single engagement, the, one of the comments from the Raptor pilots was like, it's like clubbing baby seals. See? You know, one other pilot said, honestly, he thought he was going to run out of ammo before he ran out of enemy aircraft. <laughs> this is a stealth fleet aircraft. Uh, one of the Eagle pilots said that uh, he didn't even know the guy was there until he saw him above him on his canopy. He flew right over the top of him. Wow. This is a good plane. It is expensive as all hell, but um, it can't be seen on radar. It, it, the uh, Eagle pilot said they were trying like you wouldn't believe to find them. They never could. They never saw them until they got the indication that they'd been killed. And they didn't even see them then until he flew them. But they had different uh, scenarios run. That was in, um, I believe, March 2000. Uh, let's see if I get it written in here somewhere. It's relatively recent. I'm uh, sorry, it's like 2008, I believe. Anyway, from my other notes. But the F-22 Raptor has never seen combat, but its, uh, it's stealth profile is profound. Now, it is slightly s slower than the F-15, but he has Super Cruise. And what Super Cruise is, is it allows him to fly in after burners the entire time. 
at Super Cruise, he can go one uh, just under Mach two. He has so he has better range than an Eagle does. An Eagle, when he goes at two point five, he's in afterburner mode, and he's going to burn a lot of gas real quick. This guy does not have that problem. So, granted, he's a little bit slower, but he's going to do the job when he gets there. Now, there was an incident. It's actually been on that video that we have in the hallway there. How well the stealth works. There was a uh, engagement with a MiG twenty three and an F. 15 at night and the uh, the Eagle locked up the MiG-23, fired two, har um, um, two uh, AMRAMs at the same time at a distance of about 20, 25 miles and there's an F-117 between the two. The F-117 pilot said he just saw two missiles go past his uh, windscreen, his windshield. Didn't know what the heck was going on. He, the, the two missiles missed uh, the uh, MiG, and he banks to the right. The Eagle starts to correct to keep a, a good firing solution, and it just happened to have kept that F-117 right between the two. He fires off the second, or sorry, the third AMRAM, and at that time, the F-117 pilot said he saw another missile and an F-15 go by. <laughs> now, one thing that you could take off of that, too, is that the AMRAM is radar guided. Even the AMRAMs didn't see that Nighthawk. Nobody saw that Nighthawk. The stuff is getting good. Okay, so it's dangerous out there. You might want to hang a flashlight out the canopy. <laughs> so anyway, so that's a Raptor. It's the uh, aircraft of the future. I really can't comment on the uh, F-35 at all, but... Um, if we have these guys going after the uh, enemy fighters, they're dead. I mean, if clubbing uh, baby seals, you know, from an F-15, which has got a 102 to 0 kill ratio, it's just too easy at that point. That's a spectacular aircraft. So, again, it would basically be in the strike program as well as the defensive uh, program. All right, so, um, opening shot, bring in the noise, and... I gotta say, basically, we don't do this fair. There's nothing fair about this. Uh, when we're going into these kinds of operations, the bottom line is it's like two fighters in a ring. You know, the, the other guy is sizing you up as you get in close. You got your arms up, ready to go. And just as you're getting ready to throw the first punch, somebody hits them in the back of the head with a baseball bat. We are not there to do this in a fair way. We're not there to give them any advantage whatsoever. It's going to be brutal and it will be quick. Um, Plan is finalized. All weapons systems are in place. Task Force Normandy. Now, Task Force Normandy was the very first guys to fire shots there. It consisted of two Pavlos, nine Apaches, and a Black Hawk that flew over 200 miles in the dark at 120 knots using the Pavlos um, navigation systems because the Doppler stuff that the Army has is just not that accurate. But their targets were two uh, surveillance radars 70 miles apart. Now, they only knew that part. They didn't know the entire thing of what was going on. So they just got their own picture of the pie. So the Pavlos lead them in to about 30 miles from the target. They drop in infrared chem lights out of the back of the uh, Pavlos, which means that this is your uh, our breakaway point. So you are now 30 miles from your target. They have that in, in their computers. They mark it, the Apaches do. So that gives them their last. It's almost like you're walking around in the dark and you know, oh, you're stepping on the pipe. Okay, I know where I am. So that's all they got. Again, they're working with Doppler navigation in featureless deserts. Doppler requires something on the ground to see moving beneath them. They didn't have that aspect. So they get to the release point. The Pavlos break off and they head to the south. They uh, are in two different groups. Um, Four Apaches apiece. There is one basically staying with the Pavlos. He's a backup. Um, they drop down in Little Wadi's uh, uh, dry riverbed. They are using the terrain to mask their approach. Their target is surveillance radars. And with that, they knew that they had um, anti-aircraft, radar-controlled anti-aircraft weapon systems there. So this is something that they really expected not do, not, to not do well, to not come out well. By the time they got within 12 kilometers of the target, they could see it on their thermal imagers. as uh, They could see the heat. They could see the light with their night vision systems. 
um, and they're using the iHeads uh, helmets as well. So everything that they're seeing through the sights, they're actually seeing into their eyeballs. Um, they got in close, no one said a word. And the very first thing said, put it up there, it's pretty cool. Um, this uh, one first lieutenant, let me see him here, at 2.38 a.m., 22 minutes from H hour, first lieutenant Tom Drewer called party in 10, which means that stand by to launch your hail fires, they should have impact in 10 seconds. So from five kilometers away, he gives that call at the same time, everybody from two different positions, two different target areas, 70 miles apart, they start lobbing in the Hellfire missiles. They hit the uh, communication system first, if you want to take out their ability to call for help, and then they just blasted the, uh, the uh, anti-aircraft systems, then they go and went after the buildings. They, as soon as they were expended with Hellfires, they continued moving in closer. They started with rocket fire. They are carrying only one pod of 19 high-explosive heavy rockets. Uh, they obliterate the target. They keep moving forward. They start with a 30 millimeter. They're just blasting the hell out of everything that's still moving or possibly going to move. They expended nearly 100% of their ordnance on those two targets. Now, the reason why we use two Black Hawk, uh, sorry, two uh, eight Apaches to do this instead of just sending cruise missile was these were so vital that they cannot take the chance that even one of these things survive because each hour consisted of F-111, EF-111 Ravens and F-15E Strike Eagles plowing over the desert floor at 200 feet. They had to make absolutely positively sure the Iraqis did not have any hint of what was coming. So the only way to do that was to have eyes on the target, and the best way to do that, first mission for the AH-64 Apache. Open fire. Okay. One of the Apaches actually had three bullet holes in uh, the rotor system. None of the rest were actually touched. Um, and again, they got easily within uh, kilometers of an anti-aircraft gun system. Either their, their stealthily approach was really that good, maybe these guys were asleep, again, it's 2 a.m., or sorry, 2.38 in the morning. So, they hit their targets. All of them turn around and start beating feet towards the assembly area. And uh, five minutes after they were on their way back, the first raven went right over their heads. It's good timing. You kind of imagine those pools, that you know, those cheap above-ground pools. They get a hole, and the whole thing starts splitting open. That's what you had. You had, I can't tell you how many strike eagles, but there were three... Uh, F-15E, I'm sorry, uh, Ravens that went through that hole and they basically blotted out the uh, surveillance radar uh, and the weapons radar uh, on the way into their targets, which were primarily airfields. Uh, they wanted to kill, destroy the runways right away. They didn't principally go for the aircraft and the reason for that is likely they were all these weapons to shoot down planes. Let them come up into the air. <laughs> They're just, you know, kind of hobbling them there for just a second. You can fix the runway, but, you know, for that first night or two, you want to make sure that they can't get anything above the ground. So it was an avalanche of planes right at two, uh, 3 a.m. That's when the first planes went through that hole. Uh, at the same time, and again, you got to kind of look at the Mediterranean, uh, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea. All of these had ships or submarines that were firing Tomahawk cruise missiles. They had to arrive in Baghdad at exactly the same time as the 117s were dropping their bombs. So within a matter of about a, a difference of about 12 to 15 seconds, the rounds started impacting specific targets. What they're basically going after is their communication system, their radar control system, surveillance radar system. They had harm missiles, the high-speed anti-radiation missiles. These home in on actual radars themselves. They run at um, 1,400 miles an hour. They can cover, uh, in one minute, they'll cover 23 miles in one minute. So the Iraqis started turning on their surveillance radars just at the time that those strike eagles kind of got in that area and they just let it go. So it's like turning on a spotlight in a darkened parking lot. It's kind of the last thing you really want to do. <laughs> yeah. 
Where the initial target in Baghdad was the Air Force Command and Control, the communications uh, hub, their network there, as well as the de Air Force defensive system. So you're taking away their, you hit him in the back of the head with a baseball bat, you took out his eyes, you took out away his ability to talk, you took out his ability to hear. This is that same fighter scenario we're going through. So things are going really bad for the Iraqis in the first few minutes of this conflict. They've already bloodied them pretty badly. Okay. Uh, again, this is planning that, you know, people sat there for, you know, while the, the uh, diplomats were trying to figure out a truthful, uh, easy solution to this, uh, Mr. Uh, Hussein just would not have it. He didn't know what was coming. His generals did. As a matter of fact, there was a whole fleet of patrol boats. When all of this stuff started happening and Baghdad is blowing up in flames as well as some of the air bases, there was a whole armada of Ira Iraqi patrol boats. They were trying to, you know, beating feet like hell towards Iran. The, uh, there, it wasn't the, um, the, um, the ground aircraft, the, the J-Star that saw it, but it was another type of aircraft that had that um, maritime uh, radar system saw all of these boats launching at about the same time, trying to make it into Iran. They called in a strike package. They didn't make it. So they sent their airplanes to Iran also. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, they tried. Uh, they tried. There was a timetable for that. I did not include it because that's just, you know, I, I didn't know, again, you know, how many people are going to have here for this. And I didn't want to just drag this thing out because, oh, crap. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to get through this uh, a little bit quicker here. Um, it's getting a little late. Okay, so um, they breached their defenses, uh, jamming and stealth with the Tomahawks. Uh, so as the F-117s were starting to drop, those darling little EF-111s were starting to arrive in the southern s portion of Baghdad. They started to spread out, and they had their jammers going full blast. So even though the 117s appeared to not be even noticed, this jamming was supposed to... Uh, further impair the Iraqis' radar to make sure that nobody touched those guys. Okay. All Tomahawk missiles are fired by, oh, there's quite a few of them actually. It's like 140 Tomahawks were shot, either uh, mostly by surface ships, but quite a few from the submarines. Um, seen that guy. Unfortunately, he's gone. Okay, AH-64 Apache. Um, this thing is, if they've worked all the bugs out, it's pretty good. It's got a 30 millimeter chain gun. The targeting system is second to none. The only problem is they don't see very well flying in the dark because that picks up infrared. So they have actually gone to flying with night vision goggles until they get in the target area because they can't see the trees. You know? um, uh, but it's very, very survivable. It can run for 30 minutes without any fluid in the transmission. It can take a huge amount of uh, bullets uh, it can crash a 44-foot freefall without injury to the pilot or the gunner. Uh, the only thing is, it's very vulnerable to uh, small arms fire here. These are the boxes that control the weapon systems. So if you rake across this thing with automatic fire, yeah, it'll keep flying, but you can't shoot crap. And, okay, these two, again, F-117 is no longer in the inventory, although they haven't really gotten rid of them. They're kind of like in shrink wrap storage. Wonder why. EF-111, Raven, it does nothing but jam uh, radars. It has no weapons. They actually had, in fact, uh, it's actually in here as well. There was a uh, MiG, I'm sorry, a uh, Mirage that was chasing this, trying to shoot it out of the sky uh, at night during this entire raid. Um, the uh, pilot just started bobbing and weaving lower and lower, and F-15C saw that they were in trouble. He was heading for him. He turned on his radar to acquire the uh, Mirage. And in the acquisition, it may have taken the uh, Mirage's attention away from the ground because he hit it. So the F-15 got credit for the kill as well as the F-111. Tomahawks, 1,500 mile range. They fly about 450 miles an hour. Uh, air launch cruise missiles are a little bit better, just under 2,000 miles. All of this stuff is just basically being improved year by year. Um, target priority, SCUD missiles, launch pads, storage areas, telecommunications, radar, radio facilities. Um, the next priority, once a headquarters element has been removed for coalition forces, was the destruction of the Iraqi command and control and bunkers found on the battlefield. These are the guys away from uh, Sadr City and uh, Baghdad, the guys who are out in the desert, who are controlling the Republican Guard and all the other uh, 
ground forces. Now, they haven't been touched at this point, by the way. Um, you know, they're kind of hoping that people forgot about them. No, they didn't. Um, this is a point where the uh, intensity starts going down. Where we're no longer using as many cruise missiles or any cruise missiles. We're not using as many laser-guided bombs because we're not wor worried about civilian casualties. So this is they're starting to work their way from the head uh, out. Now, part of the mission of the Strike Eagles was to take out all of the road intersections, the railway uh, tracks, the bridges, anything that you can move material down south. All right? So this is basically like you're stepping on their neck. Now they can't swallow food. Again, this is that poor fighter. You took out his eyes. You, you just made a mess of the world. So we're now moving out away from the command and control element. Now we have already still got uh, aircraft that are coming in time and time and taking out anything that needed to be taken out. Uh, the Strike Eagles were basically looking for targets of opportunity for the most part, but you've got to take out those key uh, road intersections and bridges to keep their supplies from moving down because the whole emphasis here is to start to starve those guys out. This is why it took so long after the air war started that we actually sent ground troops through. There's a point to that. Global Hawk, Reapers, and Predators are now in strong demand at this point. Um, they don't want to send them down around the Baghdad area because the ADA is too dangerous, even for the Global Hawk. Again, $200 billion taken out by a, a missile, people wouldn't be happy. Uh, let's see. Also, this is at the time that they launched um, raids from the Barksdale Air Force Base. 14,000 mile round trip. It took them something like 30 hours, one sortie. Is that the B-2? B-52. B-2. Yeah. So, uh, ordinarily they'd leave from Diego Garcia or uh, a closer uh, field, but nope, they were actually coming out of Barksdale. Uh, let see. Ground attack war. Starts when the bombing of the roadway, railroad tracks, bridges, anything and anything you have at a time. Uh, enemy target positions, use the B-52s, Hornets, F-16s, and Tornadoes, 24 hours a day. Now, the F-16 was the workhorse of the uh, interdiction bombing. They would basically come in with a heavy load of bombs at a high altitude. They would kind of go back to neutral on the engines. They would nose them over and start gliding in out of the sky. They're looking at their target. They have another uh, F-16 maybe lazing the target for them. The guys on the ground have no idea these guys are coming. They start in from about 20,000 feet. They're just completely quiet. As soon as the targeting reticle comes uh, into play with the release point, they let off the bombs, they pull it up, they start throttling away. So all of these Iraqis are looking up and they're seeing this F-16 pulling out, going away. They didn't see the bombs coming in behind them. Incredibly effective. Now it's the opposite of the Stuka dive bomber, which in Germany, it made all the noise in the dive. In this case, there was a, actually a point to this, uh, which we'll get into in just a little bit. Oh, actually, it's there. Um, expectation, once the uh, unit's effectiveness is below 30%, they can no longer maintain the ability to be an effective fighting force. Now, psychological warfare uh, reduces the uh, ground soldier's uh, will to resist. This includes radio jamming. They would actually allow them to hear radio traffic on the military net, but when they start to say something really important, they start jamming it. So it's like, you know, you're trying to listen to a phone call and somebody keeps, you know, interrupting and cutting that off. It's just annoying as hell. Um, leaflet drops. What they would do is uh, you've got um, uh, battalion element here, battalion element here, battalion element here. They may be uh, 10, 12 miles apart. You drop in leaflets on all three. This one, you basically say, we're going to start bombing you at 9 o'clock tonight. This one over here, same thing. We're going to be bombing them at 9 o'clock tonight. The one over here, we're going to be bombing those guys at 9 o'clock tonight. Sure enough, 9 o'clock comes out, those guys from Barksdale show up, and they just unload. There's a term called arc light, which means uh, basically B-52s bombing. And these guys are dropping from 35,000 feet. The ground is rumbling. You're seeing flashes on the horizon you know that these are your sister elements and they're being obliterated. By the dawn's early light, you get no radio traffic whatsoever. They are effectively gone. They're just a hole in the ground. They drop more leaflets. Unless you surrender, we're going to start bombing you at 9 o'clock tonight. Unless you guys surrender. <laughs> Guess what? If they're smart, you know, they're going to surrender. We don't want to kill everybody in sight, but... The point is made when you use a lot of force on a particular target, and this is the same thing with Nagasaki and Hiroshima. 
The, uh, they thought that we would have more casualties if we went into a stand-up fight. We had to encourage the emperor to just surrender. You can't win with this. After you've been sitting in the desert and you've been far, uh, starved, you have no water, uh, your ammo is already low, all the resupplies, they're not coming. You know, they couldn't get past the bridges, and anyone who got past that, they'd have to deal with the Strike Eagles or the F-16s. Their supplies aren't coming. They're getting hungry and hungry. Their morale is dropping. This all basically goes under what's called psychological operations. Additionally, we have fake invasions where the uh, Marines would stage a landing at some point along the coast um, east of, uh, east of uh, uh, Iraq, on the eastern coastline of Iraq. They would give you every indication they're coming in. It would cause them to pool resources over there, and the dread level, you know, the apprehension level would be cranked up. We never did that. Again, we're just playing with their heads. Low-level passes and fake bomb runs, that's what the F-16 started doing. They didn't have to pickle off any ordnance. All they wanted to do was just scare the crap out of these people. And if you've ever had an F-16 come in and do that, you know, with the quiet bomb run, you, you kind of fear that. Okay, real ground war begins. This is when they start to use the Reapers and Predators in the operation. Kill box operation begins. Ground forces begin rolling. Um, you guys are familiar, I'm sure, with the Reapers and the Predators. What is a kill box? <laughs> if you're in a kill box, you're not having a good day. Okay, what it is is uh, the kill box three-dimensional target area to uh, engage surface targets without needing coordination with the commanders. Okay, um... Bottom line is, get it here. Okay, you guys may be familiar with this. This is a basic standard uh, infantry style map with a universal transverse repeater grade system. Um, every line is a thousand meters, every single one. So when it gets to the point where now ground troops are going to start to move through, what you do is your ground troops are here. This is called the forward line of troops right here. There's nothing here, there's nothing here. This is a buffer. The A-10s are going to be hitting everything beyond this grid line. So, if you want to stay alive, do not go past that line. Unfortunately, the British went a little too fast. They strayed into a Warthog's kill box. These uh, kill boxes are basically, it depends upon the terrain, they could be as much as 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. You'll have a pair of A-10s working that kill box day and night until everything is dead. When everything is dead, they move to the next kill box. That's when you on the ground can start to move forward. You don't go forward until they call that clear box, that kill box clear. Unfortunately, like I said, uh, March 28th, uh, Southern Iraq A-10 swept uh, up a convoy of British scimitars and killed one wounding five uh, others in a single pass. That was just one pass. The other A-10 with them didn't shoot because the first guy through, when he did the burp, he realized, oh, it was that quick. They're not asking for permission to engage targets in this kill box. If they're designated uh, for that kill box, it's their kill box. Anything in it is going to die. So we're doing our absolute best to keep fratricide to an absolute minimum, but it's never going to be completely um, completely evaded. Um, but uh, yeah, it's worked by A-10 systematically to efficiently cover large areas of land before friendly troops arrive. Most important rule about kill boxes, don't be in one. This is a good example of a kill box. I've been out of the woods for a while. Forward line of troops. All our good guys are here. This is the buffer zone. This is where the A-10s are going to be working. Okay, And again, they work it until there's nothing moving in there again. Uh, we want to thank Ernie for a great presentation. Thank you.